This is Proudly Jewish, um, a, a podcast I started after the October 7th massacre, as I saw so many people in my community and people that I knew um, in the Jewish community trying to deal with, with what they just experienced, the greatest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust and um, anti-Semitism around, all around us. And I've been trying to look at issues regarding Jewish identity and, uh, and, and Israel um, from different angles, um, all about strengthening the Jewish people, but trying to understand so much about this, so much about the anti-Semitism and um, it, loss of friends and all that. And I wanted to talk about Aliyah. I always felt, I felt that right away after October 7th happened, besides the horror, that at the end of this, the end of it all, Israel will be safer, Israel will be stronger, and Israel will grow because people will make Aliyah. So I thought I would speak to you, and for uh, people watching, this is Mark Rosenberg from Nefesh Benefesh. So please tell us, Mark, what Nefesh Benefesh is and what you do. Okay, great. First of all, it's so uh, such, a, such an honor to be here. I think these conversations are so important. And uh, giving words to help process what's going on, I think that you said that was impetus to starting this is really, really important. So um, I am originally from New Jersey. I, I moved to Israel about 20 years ago. And I am proud to have worked for the past 15 years for Nefesh Benefesh, an organization that started a little over 20 years ago with the idea of removing the obstacles to make Aliyah, moving to Israel, a more successful and impactful endeavor for North American Jews. So the fundamental idea is the Jewish people, the Jewish people have been saying and Passover seders for thousands of years next year in Jerusalem. Right. And surely with the revival of Zionism uh, before the state of Israel, people were choosing to move to Israel becomes, uh, to make Aliyah. And then especially with the founding in May of 1948 to become citizens of the country, there are ways to do it. Uh, and many people who were coming, not all of them, but many people were coming, were choosing to flee from the places they were coming from because of anti-Semitism or because the conditions were so tough and they were coming to Israel. Uh, and they were being processed and they were being given citizenship and they were welcomed and giving benefits to help make sure their, their, their life would be integrated better. And North American Jews were doing that as well, um, at a trickle, at a pace. Certainly there were times where they came more often than others in the years after 1967 and also 1970. We'll talk about this later, I'm sure. Yeah. There was a, a spike of interest. But generally speaking, there were a couple uh, hundreds, maybe a thousand North American Jews, uh, choose, use this word, choosing to come to Israel. And what happened uh, about 21 years ago, um, after a tragedy, sadly, a Hamas uh, terrorist came to a bus stop in Israel and detonated, killing um, and maiming uh, a dozen or so students. And one of them was a relative of a rabbi in South Florida, in Boca Raton, Rabbi Josh Fass. Uh, and he was a person who always thought about moving to Israel. It was something they talked about with his wife when they were dating and when they were building their home. We won't get a fancy car because, you know, we're going to sell it in a few years and move to Israel. But um, life got in the way and his career got in the way. But after this tragedy, the following Shabbat in synagogue, he got up and announced to his congregation that in response to this tragedy, he and his family were going to move to Israel to help replace the void that was lost. And an interesting thing happened that that Shabbat, people came up to him at the Kiddush at the end, you know, and said, oh, we were thinking about it. Oh, we always talked about it as well. And he's surprised to find that so many people were interested in it, but not doing it. And that's where the impetus of the organization that came about is he started doing some research and said, hey, there are certain obstacles for North American Jews who are choosing to go to Israel. And maybe if we do we create this organization that we could um, help them and maybe increase the number. And I'm thinking that maybe we'll buy 50 seats on a plane and that will start the organization. And similar to some of the pictures that I actually have behind here is they filled the plane and they filled it with 350 people that first summer in 2001, wow. uh, sorry, 2002. Yeah. And to this day, 80,000 North Americans, almost 80,000 North Americans have chosen to move to Israel. And the fundamental idea was rather than realizing that, um, you know, the, life was horrible where they were living, you know, running, running away from this or that, um, especially American and Canadian Jews, the, the life is comfortable and it's very, very good. And to relate to them about the options that they have and be able to say, okay, you're living a great life in Portland. You're living a great life in Memphis. Now, if you move to Israel, this is what you get. This is what you don't get. This is how you navigate it. 
And the fundamental principle, the, the, the architecture of the organization is to help people before they make Aliyah and after they make Aliyah, the, the, the support is ongoing. And also people who went through the process, English speakers like myself, can help you translate the experience, not just from Hebrew to English, but culturally to understand how college is different, what army service would be, how taking a mortgage could be different. And that has led to uh, a tremendous response in the sense that the, the number of Oli moving to years is almost about 4,000 from North America. Yeah. And, and what, last point I'll share is that if you move to Israel in the 1980s from North America, 60% of those were leaving within two years. And we're proud to say that our numbers up by 90% are still staying in Israel. So we're offering this support and this advice and a system to help people to move to Israel and, and become integrated into Israeli society. That's amazing. Um, so many th you, you touched upon so many things that I want to talk about, and uh, I'm not sure where to begin, but uh, the idea that there's an ongoing support, that it's not just, um, okay, here's the door, um, but you recognize just the same way, you know, I moved to, from Montreal, well, I moved to Montreal to Toronto to, to here in Portland, Oregon, and I needed, you know, it's the same language, a very similar culture, and I needed a lot of help to navigate certain things. Uh, the health system was was one of them, and still, you know, six and a half years later, still trying to navigate that. But I, just at that level, moving to a new country can be daunting, um, and especially with family and as an adult, how do I work and all that? So you're you're facilitating so, and addressing so many of those things to make it less daunting. It sounds like, um, and 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 I would imagine that the people you meet are coming to you with this sort of like not not fear, but like, how am I going to do this? And you're trying to go, listen, we got you, or here's what the resources are, right? Yeah, I pretty much right, right, on, right on what you said. In the sense, first of all, the biggest obstacle to Ali, I tell people, is fear of the unknown. Yeah. Okay, just like, you're not sure, like, if you stay in Toronto, you should pretty sure elementary school where your junior high school is going to be. It's a natural flow. Whereas right. if I if I move to Modi'in, well, what school am I going to do? It's an unknown, an unknown about your career. So that that's that's a natural but also, even moving from Montreal to Toronto, in the same country, there's a little bit of a language barrier. I'll ignore that for a second. But there's, especially moving even from English-speaking Toronto to English-speaking Portland, there's those, na it's, it's this, and, and I try to ground people in the move. It's the same questions. Which which neighborhood are you going to live in? Because you don't just move to Portland. There are neighborhoods within it that you have to understand. Right. Okay, which schools are you going to choose? A job, taxes, and state to state. If you're, if you're a nurse in one state, move, there's a licensing issue. So there's natural concerns that people who are sedentary or people who grow up and uh, I'm, I'm getting to Chicago in a few days, there's a thing about people from Chicago stay in Chicago. Um, and it's it's natural, but if you're gonna move out of that comfort zone, there's natural things and natural natural obstacles or, or struggles that you have. So the idea is that if we can facilitate, remove as best we can, um, it's gonna be easier. It's, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, it, it's still difficult. It's easier than ever to make Aliyah. It's still hard. Yeah. It's still yeah. difficult. But you the know, idea is to help prepare people with proper expectations. And look, I like to, I, I can't compare that, but I like to compare daunting big things to, to a wedding. A wedding is wonderful. You want to do it. It's, it's fantastic. And there's a lot that goes into it and yeah. it can be stressful. Um, so you also touched upon something that I wanted to get to later, but you touched upon it now, the motivation. And you, this was a big point that you were making in your, your opening um, uh, few paragraphs. Uh, motivation for Zionism, for uh, for moving to Israel in the 40s, in the 50s, from different places in the world, the Ethiopians. The, yes, there's an element of this is our homeland, but for so many, the thing that makes it go, okay, now's the time, is the negative. There, There's like, oh my gosh, we're fleeing from something. And you addressed that. You said, li li leaving from the States, from Canada, is not generally the same as uh, those people who are leaving Iraq after the Farhud or leaving or Ukraine, after... or Ukraine last year. Right. And that's an entire, so maybe, maybe I'll, I'll come back to that. I, I want to get back to, um, October 7th a little bit and, and sort of go from there. Um, one would think if you, especially if you speak to somebody who's, who's not from the Jewish community and you talk about Israel, like, Ooh, you know, they might care, they, they might be sympathetic, but Ooh, you want to stay away from their danger zone. Well, there's there's war. It's 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 scary, uh, and I felt, as I said to you at the opening, uh, that Israel would grow as a result of this. 
what have you seen? Have you seen people being afraid to make Aliyah after October 7th or more willing to, and why? It's a, it's a phenomenon, I think, that you said, especially from an outsider's perspective. You think that there's a conflict and a war zone and people would, would, would step back or, or become more removed from it. We have, we have seen a, a clear doubling of interest in people making Aliyah. That doesn't mean that we're going to see in the summer a double of Aliyah. It could mean it, but it's too early. I'm not a prophet to say. But just, the, just this month, again, again, again this month in January, we received double the amount of uh, applications co compared to the, the previous January. Wow. And that, inclu that includes phone calls and requests. And our, and our programming is really being inundated with people asking questions. So I think there's a question that's why some people lean away. They're, they're concerned about it. Uh, but because of the people's familiarity with Israel, um, it's causing a lot of people to lean in, to lean into the relationship to Judaism, to lean, re lean into the relationship to Israel. And for those people who have, this has been part of their plan to leave in even further. I just listened to another podcast. I don't want to cross reference, yeah. but, oh, but on the podcast, they had this great professor, Scott Galloway. He's a marketing guru and he's, you see him on MSNBC all the time. I didn't even know he was Jewish. And he talked about how he didn't really talk about it so much and how he's become outspoken about Israel this time. And he ended the podcast by saying, even now for the first time after October 7th, he was thinking about purchasing real estate in Tel Aviv and one, one day moving there. So I think what's happened is that many people moved one click closer to Israel. Right. They just realized that if they, they were thinking about moving to Israel, you know, in a couple of years, maybe I should ratchet up my plans once more. So I think it shows this amazing uh, instinctive connection that Jews from around the world have in following the news and feeling a closeness. And for people wanting to, and this goes to the point that, uh, that you said, is um, their confidence in securing the future of Israel because they saw it hesitate on the 7th and 8th. And as they breathe and realize, okay, Israel is going to be better, I should take part of it. I, 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 I'm I, going to do something that's going to help secure it better. Some, some people it's supporting from afar, but some people saying, I want to be part of the builders and I want to be part of the people that are on the front lines. Do you feel that, <clears throat> that there's a, a reawakening or an awakening for some of what Israel means to them? In other words, for some people, Israel's always been part of their Jewish identity. And for others that I've seen, I'm, I'm, I'm clergy in, in a congregation, and I, you, know, I, you don't have to be to see this in, in Jewish communities. Uh, for others, you know, they're, they're, the idea of Israel is an idea and not sort of a, of a it, they don't always have that sense of, oh, I'm from that land and here's what's at stake. Um, do you find that there's, perhaps I'm not expressing this well, but there's, I, I've seen, an, I've seen some people go, oh, I see Israel's very existence is at stake and here's what it means to me now. Uh, here's the implications or, and, and there are other nuances to that, but have you seen that? I think that this was a moment. I, I've seen that. I think it is a moment where people separated the fiction from the reality right well said we okay. we are we are we are very cerebral people yeah we are very much we we forget that <clears throat> sorry we forget that we're embodied people because we spend most of the time in front of our computers yeah. or in front of our phones we use our brains for most of our relationships and sometimes we can get lost in our brains mm -hmm. and lost in our words and lost in our feeds and our our thumb scrolling about it and we can get israel's this or israel's that or america's this or america's that and you call names and the, the words lose their meaning a lot for people. And you call someone, oh, that's a, you're a terrorist or, you know, that's apartheid. We use these words in, 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 in battles of words and debates, as I should say. And what happened on October 7th remind us that we might say that certain people are terrorists or something like that, or that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a shame or something. But it reminds us of reframing mm -hmm. of what evil is. It reminds us of a frame what her heroism is. Right. And and I think that, that that caused a lot of people who felt distance from Israel because of the rhetoric or they they put where they felt where Israel was going or seemingly going or to the right, to the left, or whatever it would mean, that they just got very grounded. They got punched in the face. Right. And they realized that forget about all the fuzz and the buzz and the and the, the trends and stuff like that. There is that deep connection. And, and, and sadly, it takes trauma to do that. I see that in families. I'm sure you might see this as, as in a pastoral sense, 
when families are disagreeing and then there's, God forbid, a death in the family, all the nonsense moves to the side and then people rally around each other. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that the Jewish peoples, the people, the Jewish people around Israel, not in Israel, there's a lot of noise, a lot of negative noise, sometimes positive, a lot of, and it just cut through all of the fake stuff or pushed the, 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 the little stuff to the side and people could see the essence yes. of what that relationship is. And it reminded them in a in a primal sense, in a core sense, in a true Jewish values, in a in a Rosh Hashanah sense of oh, this is our this is our this is our real feeling for it. And I think that's 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 the great awakening that we're going to see be digesting over the next few, few years in Jewish education of people saying, you know what, I I see myself in service to the Jewish people. I want to volunteer for the Jewish people. I want to go into that profession more. I want to come and serve in the army. Um, I want to do stuff because now it's recalibrating. And we're still in the midst of it. So it's still very messy what's going on. People are still finding words for it. But undoubtedly, I'm, I'm traveling now. I'm actually in New York on my way to Chicago. And, and I'm listening to lots of people and speaking to a rabbi today here about it. This was, this is that your point is something that he said, that there's this, there's this, it's stirring around. And I think people are, are still just, the trauma it has not settled in people. And it's unlikely to settle exactly where it was right before. We've seen, I've seen a lot of uh, interest in, uh, in making Aliyah from, say, France, specifically France. Uh, I, I know there are other places. And uh, I read somewhere something like, like the interest in making Aliyah has shot up 500% or something like that. And I wonder if the motivation, if you have that information, if the motivation that you're seeing about people moving, making Aliyah from the US and Canada is the same as the motivation for uh, Jews making Aliyah from France or maybe even England from from Europe. Have, is there a can you address the uh, you know sure. similar so, contrast? Sure. So I, I think that first of all, Professor Ruth Wise says that She's my professor at McGill, by the way, amazing, a, a yeah. brilliant person. I recommend yes. Google her and and listen to her podcast if you can. Read her books. She says that immigrants always move to a country where they think their life is going to be better. So even if someone is running away from Ukraine and they're coming to Israel or someone's coming from yeah. from Philadelphia, they're choosing to move because they see that their life is going to be better. So what, what, when, when you look at this analysis, and it's interesting that Aliyah interest is up in Europe, and I would I would just got an update just when I left Israel yesterday, that we are still double the interest from the U.S. In France, it has gone down in this month a little bit. Not a lot. You know, it's still up. Yeah. But so it's, it's it's a curiosity about what's driving it. And you have to remember that there's a different culture. And my analysis, is you have to remember that in France, in Europe, there is anti-Semitism baked in institutions, a terrible history, a shadow of anti-Semitism that hovers, a cloud that hovers over it. So to be too dramatic. Whereas in the United States, also, I don't like, I don't want to speak about Canada, but my experience in the U.S., there are anti-Semites, hateful people. But there isn't a history as much, and it's and, and and therefore, even though there have been a spike in the ADLs talking about these actions that that, are, that terrible things that are going on, just I heard about another restaurant that was vandalized here, that yeah. that are disturbing, disturbing. Th- there's a different context that that has to be regarded for um, North Americans versus Europe and their motivations, um, and the climates, the climax, the, the climate that's there. It's specifically, they're talking about European Jews. Um, and I, I and I heard this about a, le- a lecture about French Jews is that they're squeezed in a terrible way between the far right, yeah. which doesn't want immigrants, okay, and then the immigrants specifically from Arab countries that don't want the Jews. So yeah. they're they're in a terrible position that they're being squeezed from both sides, and therefore causing some people to do the math to say that they should they should relocate. Uh, whereas in the United States, there there's definitely some voices from the far right and from the far left, but the the center is is holding them at a, at a different rate. Nonetheless, um, it, it is it's a personal calculation that that people have to make to see what what's the environment for them. And that one one of the reasons the etras of the state of Israel is one to be a safe haven, yeah. and that was one of the the ideas of Zionism. And the others is a cultural center, something a place that's going to be a thriving place, a beacon of Judaism, a beacon of what it means to be the Jewish people. So some people are looking. To, to come to the beacon, and some people are just looking for shelter. And and there is crossover with those two ideas, right? Like, if my kid 
I have younger children, but let's say my kid is going to go uh, to university and I'm seeing what I'm seeing with a more hostile environment that is anti-Semitic. I want my child to be fully Jewish and be able to be, to live their lives as proud Jews, uh, right? The, the name of the my podcast, proudly Jewish. And I might be worried if my kid was, you know, 18 years old going to university right now, uh, how do we do that? And uh, I, I suspect that right now with the American Jews that are making Aliyah, that there's this there's this different kind of a shadow of uh, perhaps the potential of anti-Semitic uh, an anti-Semitic future and the reality that their that their kid might be uh, facing. And listen, I want to be fully Jewish. I want to be able to to walk down the street and order kosher food and not have someone look at me or wear my kippah or not even that or just speak Hebrew or whatever that might be, that that Jewish thing might be, and be among my own. Um, I, 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 It comes down to, are people running away from or running towards? I keep coming back to that. And I sus- and there's this dance. Um, I, sus- I suspect there's a bit of A and a bit of B that you're seeing uh, in, in, in everybody Am I, uh, or, or in a so, lot of people. So that was our suspicion as well. So uh, even last year, we, we put in a question, a survey in our application, and we're seeing that less than 5% of the people are mentioning anti-Semitism as a driving factor for their aliyah. Wow. So that doesn't surprise me, but you know, I was curious in light of what's going on. Now, it, question, and one of the things I think about is, um, is that, is there an I- ideology of people who make aliyah that, that's different than you or people in Portland or Seattle or, you know, or, or Dallas? It is. And it's interesting. I think that my brother who lives here in New York, who I'll be spending the night, so I want to speak nice about him as well, has the same ideology as me. He loves Israel. He thinks Israel is the center of the Jewish people and is anchored on that. But practically speaking, I was ready to make a step that he wasn't. And I was r- r- willing to take the risks and, and the practical means of choosing to move to Israel and put my kids in the schools there and, and, and look for a job, all the things that goes with the unknowns of moving there. So sometimes people think there's an ideological difference of people who move to Israel. And I, I push back against that. I think that what happens is when people look at their plan and where they want to be, they, they run the practical numbers and, and, and see what, what's going to be good for them. So specifically in, in this pipeline that we're having now and looking at people, it practically makes sense for them. And, and, and I should mention that people are moving to Israel. 99.5% of them have spent time in Israel beforehand. Right. In fact, anyone who calls up Nefesh Benef and says, hey, I want to make Aliyah and I've never been to Israel, we strongly, strongly, strongly suggest that they come to Israel because I don't want them to get here and discover that it's very, very hot. Yeah. Hebrews are hard language. Israelis can be pushies and we have very bad neighbors. Right. Okay. We rather, you know, the downsides so that when you come here, that you'll be able to build your life with those known realities. Yeah. And, and, and therefore, I think that the fact is that the, it's, it's not just the ideology for him. It's, there's a timing element to it. And, and whereas most people and, and the, the anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism gets the headlines, um to, so often but most times it comes back down okay. and other people say you know it returns over they're, they're going to fight back and they're going to push for it better and th- they hope that it's going to be restored to a to a better place and and i think what you what you touched upon i think that the commonality of the people who do come they do feel this power of building the state of uh, living a jewish life out loud you know or yes. you know that it's that, that it's just a great place to, to live and they're not afraid of this, in fact, they say that there's the 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 danger is a known danger here. Whereas where they live in the United States, sometimes it's an unknown danger of violence, an unknown danger of what, what could happen. So mm-hmm. I think it's yeah, it's a, really about the timing and the practical elements, and therefore the it's it, it we see things very very different in, in Israel. The, the view of what's happening is very very different, and and sometimes I get calls and I'm like. My son walked to school, walked home from school by himself in Jerusalem. Like I, I understand you're hearing is very, very dangerous, but like my ten year old, you know, we felt comfortable with him walking home the, the fifteen right. minutes by himself. So it's it's hard to see that perspective uh, without spending time in Israel and and speaking to people. And uh, there's a, a a great amount of positivity about about what's what's happening in it all, despite uh, the the terrible situation we're in on our on our fronts. I, I loved your uh, phrase, "living out loud." Um, th- it says so much. Uh, it says so much. It says so much because I, I remember when I was a student in George Washington University. Yeah, I, if, yeah. if I was, if I left Hillel with my kippah on, I felt weird. If I, 
Imagine walking with a shofar. People would be like, what's that? You do any of that in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or Tel Aviv, and no one's going to look at you. You right. blow the shofar. No one's going to. It's 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 just it's it's a it's a different environment and and it's it's a very very diverse 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 place. Yeah, and people have have have, have w- ways of expressing themselves in lots of different ways, and I think that is that's that driving factor that immigrants need to understand. And we use we use the fancy term aliyah because it's a great it's a spiritual term, yeah. but in reality, immigration is a tough thing. And any any of your listeners think about that kid in their elementary school who moved in. I had a kid from Russia that came in the '90s, and he's like he had a funny his, he had a funny his parents had a funny accent. I'm the parent with a funny accent now. <laughs> Okay, I'm that person. I'm the immigrant. I'm the one that my daughter. I spoke at my daughter's school last week. She's like, "Don't embarrass me, please. Don't embarrass me." You know, I'm that right. parent that's there. But yeah. but I feel like there, there there's a greater thing going on, and and I'm and I'm planting seeds for a beautiful future for my children, my family, and also the Jewish people. Well said. And you know, regarding childhood, um, by the way, I moved from Africa. I was I was in what was called Zaire at the time, the Congo, sure. and I moved to we moved to Canada when I was eight. And uh, I was that new kid and learning English and I spoke English well, but, you know, I don't I don't know all the, the slang and the idioms and what have you. Um, and, and I had to learn hockey quickly. Uh, you know, you're going to be accepted. Um, but with children, I, I, th- with that analogy or that that compare, yeah, comparing the context, I, I felt like what you talk about living out loud, it's sort of like, listen, kid, you know, child of mine, if you're with if, or any child, if you're with people who are not supporting you, who are kind of against you, though not your real friends, be with people who are going to help uh, you be your full self and be happy. And uh, if your circle of friends is a little smaller, then it's a little smaller, but at least you're with your um, your friends. And I hear, I'm hear i hearing that in, in that what you're talking about, that experience of living out loud is being with those people who help support you ultimately with who you are. Um, I, can I, I, can I, I add to, on the point? I would, it's just, it's just two interesting no, please, comments please. on that. One is, both from Israel and abroad. From Israel, you see that type of unity across Israeliness, even with non-Jews, yeah. that we feel this sense of that we're in this together. And I also recently I heard from Prisma that there's been a high enrollment, or increase in enrollment in Jewish day schools since October 7th, where mm-hmm. many people are pulling their kids out of regular school, public schools, yeah. to put them in, in a Jewish environment, some of them Israeli parents, some of them just Americans, precisely because they feel as if there's this concentration of community that's going to l- lead to feeling a little bit stronger. I think that's that's part of this awakening as well is that people are just saying, okay, I need to I need to feel that strength even though I, I might be a minority. I, 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 Israel yeah. feels like a minority in the world just right now. We're a very small yeah. country um, and there's a lot of other people against us. And when you draw closer to that, you, you, you feel stronger. Uh, one time I was on a Kibbutz. I, I, I volunteered twice, and I remember this one time. I was volunteering a uh, kibbutz alumim, and uh, uh, back in the day, and this one guy was an American who had made aliyah years, years before, an older gentleman, uh, and he said to me, "Some so when are you making aliyah?" And I said, "I don't know. I don't know. I was 18, I think." And uh, he said, and "He said very seriously. He said you owe it to us." And I know what he meant. Like we put the groundwork here, we pioneered, you know, whatever it is, we're, we're, we're putting the groundwork here so that Jews can live their their lives as Jews in the Jewish homeland. And I have a great love for Israel and um, Jewish ancestral connection, this, this connection to a Jewish ancestral home. And I never made Aliyah. Do you feel you made Aliyah, you represent an organization, uh, you work for an organization that helps, facilitates. Do you feel that Jews around the world should live in Israel? Yes, no. Can you comment? It's a great question, and you asked it so beautifully. <laughs> I think that Jew, the Jewish people have to establish what their connection is to the state of Israel. It's undeniable that there we have a history. I, I mean, there was a ridiculous story, I think, from mid-October about this rally against uh, against Israel that these Jewish group was doing, and they had a Torah reading from the weekly Parsha, and in that weekly portion, it said the land that I promised. Like there's there's this undeniable connection. So everyone has to navigate, okay, what that connection means, okay. And one of the expressions, if not the highest expressions, is that uh, is living in Israel and that connectivity that happens by doing the mitzvot that are there or be amongst speaking the language. But that is that is one of the ways to do it. But by no means, I, I I'm not a shamer. I don't believe that it's the the only way to do it. 
And I think that you have to just be able to be able to verbalize how we have that connectivity for it. And, and, and whether it is through your volunteering, through your activism, through your finance, financial support, um, spending time in there, visiting, it's, there's many different ways to ex make that expression, but it is important for you to do it. I had, I had an adoptive family in, in Tel Aviv when I spent a year, junior year in college in Israel, and she was from my hometown, and she married a seventh-generation Israeli. Mm -hmm. And every time I was there, Zohar says, you two make an aliyah. Why don't you two make an aliyah? Every time he would he would he would give me he would give me the business. So four five years later, I come back and I say, Zohar, I made Ali. I go, why'd you do it? <laughs> and I, I was in shock. I was in shock for a second. And it happens. The cab drivers do it. You make Aliyah. Why don't you make Aliyah? And then they're like, and then they're then like, but America's so awesome. Why don't you? And I realized that he wanted to see whether I was tough enough. Yeah. In the first bump along the road, the first rocket that's going to come that I'm going to I'm going to leave. So Israelis have a they're they're prickly about this. They want you to come. They want you to know that they're the center of the world. But they it takes it takes a maturity to see that we're, we're really in this together, and and it's sometimes hard for people. And I think this is one of the dynamics that led to a lot of the noise in the Jewish world over the past de decades is that once upon a time American Jewry was the center yeah. of Jewish life in numbers and activity. Okay, and it's safe to say. That the numbers in Israel are, are about, if not in the next few years, to become the majority of Jewish people in the world. And culturally wise, music for sure, and stories and activity, it's, it, Israel's producing a tremendous amount of content for the Jewish people. And therefore, you have to navigate what this means that, wait a minute, I don't speak Hebrew, but you know most of this content that's in Hebrew, and how, how are you going to react to that? Or, you know, I can travel, and a majority of American Jews have never been to Israel one time, wow. despite birthright. So I think you have to navigate that. And some people speak in terms of all or nothing. Okay, it's Aliyah or nothing. I don't believe in that. I believe in understanding Aliyah is a movement. It's a direction. And even more so, Ayal, that when you, once, you make, once you move to Israel, it doesn't end. You have to be by Aliyah once you get there as well. It's not a destination. Aliyah is not a destination. It, it is a direction that we have to go in. And we have to keep on building that way. And it doesn't, when you make Aliyah, it doesn't shut off your connection to your community. You can have ways to, to be connected from your the people who used to live in your neighborhood. What's happening now? We're we're interconnected, and this all or nothing um, language I think is destructive. Well, I, I appreciate that. You know, it's uh, I had that tug, and and I said that I didn't, and uh, you know, I don't want to live my life thinking I was, um, you know, I failed at that. And at the, and and then there are, and I don't think I did, but but I so I appreciate hearing what you're saying. But also, there are plenty of people where it doesn't cross their minds to do that. And you don't want to say to, you know, and I don't want to say you're you're less of a, a Jew for that. Um, so I don't believe that. And um, but I do think that Israel is a an intrinsic part of world Jewry. Right. I, I think it's a I grew up on that. My name is Eyal for a reason. My parents wanted to instill that in in me from from birth. Mm -hmm. There is a we're part of this new Jewish identity where Israel has a place. Israel exists for 2000 years. The Jew lived here or there in the world and and was separated from their their homeland. Mm -hmm. And it was a dream. And here we are. And I, 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 I feel that the greatest, most impactful event in Jewish history in 2000 years was not the Holocaust, but the birth of Israel. And, and, and I don't know that world Jewry, and I speak about American Jewry, has recognized how to be a diasporic uh, people with that reality. Because you went from, we went from diaspora to diaspora we were in a better diaspora now in America, right? And in, in Canada, we're in a much better place than my father was in Morocco or, or this person was in, uh, in Germany or Poland. Yes, but we didn't have our own land. And I think that there's work to be done in the diaspora communities, especially in the States and Canada, to understand what our role is to Israel and what Israel's role is with us. So I'm gonna ask you, that question. Uh, what do you feel, what do you think should Israel's, should the role of Israel be in 
the American Jew? Hmm. And I know people are different. So I, I think that um, one of the things about October 7th is I think it, it reminded us a lot not to take things for granted. And for those first 12 hours that we Israel was invaded, literally yeah. invaded, it took almost 24 hours to to push the invaders out, if not even 36 hours. Um, people felt as there was a little bit of loss of in, 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 invincibility or such, even though, OK, it was pushed yeah. back definitively and, and uh, strongly. That's part of the trauma. And I think we have to think about what 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 we take for what, what what why we took it for granted, and and what to do it. Listen, the 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 best best half of musical in the world is Fiddler on the Roof, okay. And a lot of young people haven't seen it. And all the best famous songs are in the first half, but it is a very very telling movie about the diaspora life, and it reflects a diaspora life that is very far different than it is today. Because the fundamental metaphor is that the only place that the fiddler can play is on the roof. A fiddler's supposed to be in a concert hall on flat ground, and it's not fair for the Jew. And therefore, you come to Israel, you get this beautiful symphony hall, and you could do these amazing, amazing concerts. Nowadays, in the diaspora, most Jews have that, that luxury as well. And I think Israel has to also do some work about this, of understanding the role of diaspora. That mentality of, oh, you must do come here, the only future is in Israel, is, is an unhealthy, that unhealthy attitude and that sense of peoplehood is reawakening in Israel. Lots of missions are coming to Israel and and seeing people and, and in Ofakim bumping into people and some saying, you know, I'm from Teaneck, New Jersey. I just want to come and say that we're with you. Is is leaving a tremendous impact for people as well. So you have to remember that, that, that there is that family aspect. So I think, first of all, it and I think it goes back to your previous question, is every person, every person has to understand how to experience Israel. Yeah. And if you really experience Israel, whether it's a gap year, or on a visit, or volunteering in Sarel, you will have a thought of Aliyah during that visit, during that experience. If you really can experience Israel, okay, then it will be in your heart, okay. And even when you don't like the prime minister for this, or the soccer team disappoints you for that, you'll it will be a deeper value for you because the power of the state of Israel is is a laboratory of the Jewish people. It's a physical place where you get to experiment with these ideas. And I, I give you one example of this. When there was a hurricane in um, Cuba or one of, the, one of the islands in there. So what did American Jewry do? Is They raised money. Yeah. Okay. They sent money to the American Red Cross. What did the state of Israel do, Ayo? Mm, yeah. They sent a hospital over. Wow. They sent doctors and x-ray machines. And they sent up a field tent for several months and ran a hospital. Because that's what the Jewish people do. Mm. Okay. That is a response that a country will goes beyond themselves. Even in Turkey, countries that aren't, there's an earthquake, they send a group of people to go help because that's how we react. And that's how, the, it's not it's not the Toronto Jewish community that did it or, you know, better. It's like this, the, on behalf of the Jewish people, this is what we're doing. Amazing. And to see the Jewish people of Federation raise almost a billion dollars to the rebuild sends a tremendous message. They yeah. haven't spent all of it. They spend very little right now because they really want to impact it in re rebuilding and rehabilitating the parts of the country. That's a tremendous message. So if, if people can figure out how to experience Israel, be it through a visit, be it connecting through the music and the, the dynamic, dynamic ideas that are happening, no longer, and this is true, no longer, like I, I grew up in the U.S. and there was like a typical American and I grew up, there was a typical Israeli, and it was a secular kibbutznik, and that's why no longer do we have those stereotypes. There's no such thing as a typical Israeli, okay? And Tel Aviv has like 800 synagogues in it, so don't say it's a secular city. And you should see the Shabbat things on the Friday nights on the beaches that people do. And there's a tremendous amount of, of diversity there, so you have to find those ways to connect and find your way to connect, because I think that is like, that's the depth that is behind it. And to take that for granted um, is is uh, is to live in your own smaller world and forget about the collective that we're in. And the mission, and this is a, this is very large language. The mission of the Jewish people to to do good, to make the world a better place, to 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 spread our message of values, and and to do that is 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 very very powerful. It's complicated because it's a democracy, and some people get votes. We don't want the vote. It's it gets. It's I'm not I'm I'm not chewing away the messy part of it as well. But that messy part is 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 how we have that competition of ideas, and I think that it's 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 a paradox because we're living in a time of I, before October October sixth, 
there's a paradox. It's like it's the it's, there's been no better time to live as well, but then it seemed no better better time of us fighting as well. Yeah. So at least we can recalibrate that a little bit and and channel that into into good outlets. You know, you you said earlier about Aliyah not being um, a destination or something like this, but being a, a direction. And you, you're, you, what you said here is very similar to that. And the idea the idea that um, Israel's a, a real place and it's a thriving culture. It's diverse and uh, it 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 grow, a culture grows and it, and it in many so many ways. And that's just life. Uh, it's just it's not like okay, we have our state done. 1948 is over. 1948 Israel is different from 50, 1956 Israel, which is different from 73 Israel. And a big part of that is the cultural uh, impact that new cultures have brought to that land. And mm-hmm. um, I, I, and, and beyond that, you talked about music. And I, I loved your that you brought up, going back, you brought up uh, Fiddler on the Roof. As a composer, as a cantor, you know, you're speaking my language. But beyond that, my a personal level, my, my father's mother... Moroccan, Nina Pinto Biton, and uh, she barely spoke English, and that was her favorite musical because it was so Jewish, because even though culturally it was so different, it was so much her experience uh, as, as a Moroccan Jew. But that the, the idea, though, is the idea that there's this mix, and for the, for her, it, it might, for me, looking at my grandmother, uh, connecting to this Polish, East European Jewish experience and living in America, that's Israel. The idea that there's this, um, not exactly melting pot, but this true multiculturalism within world, you know, a Jewish context. It's a, I know it's a thriving place and, uh, and, and I, I love that you brought up the music. Let, let, let me. I, yeah, I was going to respond by saying um, one of our thought leaders in Israel is uh, Michal Goodman. Uh, and he is speaking a lot about this idea of the, what, what's, what's happened since October 7th and what was happening beforehand. And one of the things he talks about is uh, uh, this fight between uh, liberalism and uh, a more provincialism, but also individualism versus collectivism. And I think in America specifically, and I think it's true for Canada as well, there's hyper-individualism. It's really, really about individualism. And it, it's to to a, to a negative degree where people get detached and isolated. And now people in America are marrying at an older age, or if they're ever getting married. Israel, that is not going on. People are getting married at a young age. Everyone, religious or secular, are marrying, having three or four kids. And one of the things that attracts them to that Israeli, uh, I think, olim, is this sense of collectivism. They're sent a, a collective story, and I think that's why Aliyah is going to go up. It's why the population in around Gaza Strip is going to double in the next few years. People are going to want to move there to stick it and make a point of it. There's a sense of of togetherness that is greater than the individual, and I think that that is one of the the the, the things that should come from this is a reawakening of this idea uh, of the in the Jewish community that that we're we're in this together, even outside of Israel. I know that people are talking about COVID. People weren't going back to synagogue in COVID and community was less because now you can zoom. There is something about that bond of us together and the power of what we can do together and music, okay? And people being exposed to those tunes. I had never met a B-tone growing up in New Jersey, okay? I A day doesn't go by where I don't bun, bump into a B-tone in New in, in, in Shalim, okay? Nisim B-tone took me to the airport. I, I'm I saying, no, 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 no doubt about it. So I think that one of that is that exposure. We had Kube, we had Kube for dinner Wednesday night. Um, it's, it's that exposure to the sounds that that allow you to ring in the greater texture and tapestry is really instead of stuck in my own narrative and my own story. So the more that we can expand that out and 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 bring people in, it's it's I think it, people are hungry for it. And I just want to add on. I think that's why we're also going to see and we're seeing the beginning of it arise in people who want to come and serve in the IDF because they want to do something that is greater than them. They want to serve. They want to be a part of that collective. So I think I've got one or maybe two more questions for you. Um, I was watching Nefesh Ben Nefesh videos and on, on Instagram, on YouTube, and they're beautiful. They generally are, the ones that I've seen are, you know, about why, or the success stories about moving to Israel, but but why, they're like commercials to, to make Aliyah, basically. And they're beautiful. It has been so dark. 
over the last 12 days and the light that you brought to this country is just remarkable. Being here during a time of war has definitely made me feel more a part of the nation. We wanted to join our millions of brothers and sisters here and to help in any way we can. Israel needs us more today than it did uh, before, so uh, we felt that we had to come now. Well, I've really got a lot of perspective of why I'm coming, that you have to take the bad and the good together, and part of being Israeli means that even when there's things going on that are bad, you're here and you're helping you. And that way, when it's good, you can celebrate and enjoy the good. I think that now is the best time to make Aliyah, given everything going on in Israel right now. I think it's a way for us to fight back And my bracha to you is that the light that you've given us this morning and the light that you're going to continue giving us may be reciprocated with a life of bracha, of bi'ut, of simcha. May God just give you so much shalom, peace. Thank you for lighting our lives. Mazal tov. It's really beautiful. And what struck me is, and you've already addressed this to some extent, is that it is not, you know, if, if you asked me how to how to how to do it, I might go, oh, look at look at that, what's going on in the university over there. You're not very welcome over there. Oh, look what happened over there. You're not welcome over there as a Jew. Yes, you're welcome here, but it's threatening over there. Make Aliyah. And it's not like that. What I see with Nefesh Benefesh is not this sort of fear-mongering that perhaps I might have done if I were in charge of that. Um, it's it's these positive stories these give a hug to somebody or um you know can, can you speak to that like why was this I'm, I'm assuming you're not part of the advertising part of this but it's interesting nefesh benefesh has taken more of a positive spin instead of saying you know we know things are bad the only place you you know you're going to feel safer is here can you address that like why is that a conscious decision it looks like it is and, and why is that what's what's like the tone of nefesh benefesh it is a very, very conscious decision. Unfortunately, someone sent us a picture from January 6th saying uh, the, the rally, the, the protest there was sponsored by Nefesh Benefesh. We were aghast. Oh. And January that was the, the riots in the Capitol. That, that was, uh, we were aghast. We were like, what a, what a horrible, horrible message to say that we would be happy that something terrible is happening to your community so that you could join us in the state of Israel. That is a terrible, terrible message. And therefore, our decision. Is to is, is to get our message out to market to do our our public relations to make sure that people hear the real life stories. Sometimes people are like, "Oh, you don't say that," you know, "you don't say it's really hard or horrible." I'm like, I don't know any college universities that do that either. You know, come to us. Many kids study all night long, and they you know they lose a lot of weight because final exams are very difficult. We try to make sure it's not Disney World that we understand that it's real life, and these are real people. In fact, I'll say it even more so. I think the people that make rob that, that make the the people who make Aliyah heroes, they, they make it so distant and so impossible. They make it seem like Avram Avinu made Aliyah. Like I'm not Abraham. I'm I'm not. I couldn't do that. I'm not like that. And it, it causes causes people to recoil back. Like oh, I'm I don't have that trend. Whereas I think the people that get off the plane here, okay, they have done something heroic, okay, but they don't think of themselves as hero. It was brave for them to. They don't see themselves as heroes. The soldiers that are currently in Gaza, or my friend who's in a tank on the border, do not feel like heroes. They are doing what needs to get done on behalf of the state of Israel and the Jewish people. So I think that our message really is 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 to stay positive because we feel also that's influence. It's it's the way to, it's the way to get people to understand because usually, I mean, we're we're in the stories of the Exodus from Egypt and the ten plagues. The whole message there. I I, I I'm a teacher by training here is that the miracles don't convince people. All the 10 wonders, Pharaoh's not convinced, they split the sea, the Jewish people still complain afterwards. And even at Mount Sinai, you know, 40 days later, they have a whole golden calf incident of it. 
I think there's a very intentional message in the book of Exodus is that you have to ground yourself in a strong, strong belief and, and connect to what's true and, and, and don't believe in what's fake. So we, we, we intentionally want to make sure that it's focused on the real and the positive um, and also to remove, remove the excuses. So people say, oh, you know, oh, I, I didn't know that or that, that, that they're going to come and, and really see Israel for what it is. It, it's called the promised land. OK, that's high expectations to promise to promise people things. So we, we really want to be in, in a, a lived land. We want to be in a place where people understand that, you know, you, you have to pay your cell phone bill. OK, you got, you got to go to the DMV. The DMV is not so nice with us. I know the, the DMV probably in Portland is also not so nice. It's like it's very, very real for people. Yes, I do live on a street uh, that is that is a name from a person from the Mishnah. And I, I do get to walk by the old city walls. I have tremendous, tremendous, like wonderful things that happen from us. But you have to navigate both that spiritual world and the real world as well. And we, we try to do that in the most positive terms possible. I think final question would be for the for the Jewish community, my audience, the Jewish community in North America, who are grappling with October 7th and Jewish identity in the context of, um, in that context, in the context of, of a new anti-Semitism that, or that, that an exposed anti-Semitism. Um, what is your vision, not vision, but what, what do you think the, and, and look, and, uh, to add to that, not just us here, but we look at Israel and we go, we realize, oh, this is, this is an existential threat that is very real. Um, what is the future of Israel and the Jewish people? Uh, how is it, is it, I, I know you can write a whole book on that, but to the person who is sitting here going, oh my gosh, I'm living in uncertain times. I don't know what tomorrow holds, if it's dark or if it's bright. Uh, I don't know what Israel's future is. I don't know what mine is here. With what you're seeing regarding Aliyah and regarding the growth of Israel um, and the mood there, and you you yourself have this one foot in America, one foot in Israel, like because you were, you were born here uh, and you have family here, what's your take? Um, is the future bright or dark? I think the future for the Jewish people is really, really bright. I'll say God willing, because we, we fight a lot and I, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer as well. So I, I like to think that we're guided by, by, by our faith and our determination, but our faith is also in ourselves. And we have to, we can't forget where we came from. We can't forget that we are indigenous to the land of Israel, that we are connected there and that we have survived terrible and dark, dark times. And I once had a student who was 18 year olds in Israel and it was Passover. I said, what are you doing for Seder? She says, oh, I'm not religious. I'm like, so what are you doing for the Seder? She goes, oh, I'm not doing a Seder. I said, everyone in Israel does a Passover Seder. Some people have bread at their Seder, okay? And she said afterwards, she's like, I made a big mistake, okay? So we say at the Passover Seder, okay? At every generation that rises up against us, we say that every year. And we, it's not just words. We're not, the rabbis, and they did not put it in there for us to remind us that our job is to react and to be proud and to, and to, and to shine the light. Um, I am a big believer. I'm a, I'm a big student of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Dr. Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs of Blessed Memory. And he says about this power of, uh, uh, this, the, the power of influence. It's different than power. I have power and I give it to you. I don't have power anymore. But when I have influence and I give it to you, it's like passing from candle to candle. I have light, and now you have light. My light still remains, and you could pass that light on to me. The Jewish people are to spread light in this world. And when darkness comes, okay, I'm, and now I'm crossing from Passover to Hanukkah, we have to drive out the light. And I believe that seeing from my neighbors, okay, some of them who have been away from their homes for 116 days, okay, and the resilience, and, and many of us who've been to many, many funerals, okay, and hold our breaths every morning when we check the news to see if, making sure that our children or our neighbors' children aren't having fallen or gotten injured. We are extremely resilient. We are extremely positive. And we see that possibility. We see that amongst the strength um, of the Jews around the world. But we have to remember, we have to look inward, okay? We have to lean into our tradition, okay? And then that will give us the strength to move outward. So I think that the positivity has to be really in the, the righteousness of our cause, because Lord knows that, you know, to be attacked in such a viciously way, more people should be on our side. But we have to have that, we have to have that determination, not just faith. 
we have to have the determination to see it through um, and to stand up and be proud. I think that's what's, that's what I, I really appreciate about your efforts here and, and this podcast is that um, you have to really have study so you know what to say, but to have the pride in, in what we're trying to do and to make sure that we're still stay focused on that because we're going to get distracted or someone's going to say something stupid or we're going to get caught up in this. We just have to really, um, really get back to the core of what makes us um, uh, makes us special in our mission. That, right. And that's the essence of being Ba'aliyah in a growth oriented. We have to be growth oriented. We have to be rising. We have to be pushing in a direction of going higher and better. Thank you. Thank you for making the time. Thank you for the conversation. This has been a delightful uh, conversation and uh, you're doing amazing work. I, I uh, it's a, it's, I know it's 20 years and counting and uh, anything to make this easier for a lot of people, but also bridging in, even though you're dealing with Aliyah, you're also bridging um, that, that cultural and connection, but also part of our identity, even for those of us who are not going there. Uh, so thank you for making the time. Mark Rosenberg from Yadid Ben Nefesh. Yadid, sorry, Yadid. Mark Rosenberg from Nefesh Ben Nefesh. Uh, thank you so much for joining uh, me this uh, this afternoon and um, and be well. Thank you. We should all hear good news and we should uh, return to peaceful and uh, healthy times. Thank you. Thank you.